So the work I'm discussing today is on a view at Waterloo Arts until May 15th. Uh, happy May Day, everybody. Uh, International Workers' Day. So uh, hug your local union members, please. Um, I really hope you can all make it to see the work in person. Uh, today, I want to talk about the logic of the show, TGIF. At the end, I will discuss briefly the spatial narration of the show and its clusters of images as I'm thinking about them. But for now, I'd like to start at the beginning and expand on the various bodies of work present in the exhibition. So hopefully uh, we'll have time for questions at the end, um, but I wanna take us through the logic of painting and drawing that I'm invested in, uh, beginning with the impetus for the show, essentially. But, okay. So this show is uh, very experimental for me. Um, I've, I've, I've never really been able to have the freedom to put a show like this on and probably never will again. But uh, with that said, I'd like to thank Lane Cooper, the board at Waterloo Arts, as well as Amy Callahan, Kaylee Salzano, and uh, Jamie cohen Corelli for their help and assistance and inviting me to exhibit my work. So I had my first solo show here uh, in 2014 during the uh, blizzard of 2014. So I don't know if anyone remembers that, but uh, hopefully we get some good, good weather for this one. But so when asked to show, I felt a bit defeated and everything that uh, happened over the course of the year. So 2020 started out with me uh, being hospitalized and then COVID took over and I felt like I wasn't really making anything. Uh, but uh, my partner, Nikki had reminded me that, you know, I've been drawing a lot and most people that know me know that I kind of like to draw obsessively. <clears throat> the show really grows out of an examination of popular culture that I've been invested in uh, over the, the past five to seven years. I could stretch it back farther, but I think uh, as far as embedding it into my work, it really starts around 2015 or so when I begin to lean into the language and resonant narratives of science fiction. The work in this show in particular, although some comes from before the pandemic, is mostly work made in solitude after the quarantine. So I have many things I'd like to talk about uh, during this discussion, but I also wanna to try to stay contained within the show itself. So uh, I've been known to drone on and get off topic. Uh, so I hope you can bear with me in my notes that help me kind of organize my thoughts as we go. <coughs> so TGIF, the show title is a reference to the idiom, thank God it's Friday, which I'm conceptualizing in a few different ways. Firstly, it references the idea of the weekend, freedom from labor, uh, the hope of escaping the life being sucked out of you by managers, overseers, landlords, and banks until you continue the cycle again on Monday. Uh, giving the talk on May 1st is a real treat, right? So second, it has a few cultural manifestations in the form of a low quality family dining establishment, as well as a childhood block of television that usually centered around family oriented situational comedy. So shows like Family Matters and Full House. Uh, lastly, the show opened on Good Friday, making reference to thanking God and it being Friday itself. But letting the multitude of analogies interplay and exist simultaneously, hopefully the dialogue between religion, commerce, pop culture, and Americana commingle as a kind of master narrative of the exhibition. So I wanna kind of talk about, oh, there we go. Hopefully it doesn't go automatically, but. I want to begin by kind of giving some framework for my painting. So as in the title, the simultaneity of painting in postmodernity turned towards the complexity of the network in post postmodernity. So some use the term atemporality, a space of interstitial time between epochs. So modernity and what comes next as postmodernity becomes a sort of image of itself or a motif. I think about painting as a way to investigate the history of images, semiotics, and the grand narratives that deliver us into the present, both socially and culturally. Painting for me is psychoanalysis and archeology, span only set in the garbage dump at the end of history. Not so much a grand narrative of discovery, but a digging through the trash of history to piece together a narrative of contemporary reality. In my work specifically, I'm looking at paintings as a site for event, site or an event of meanings. I'm interested in how style, genre, and mode become image, motif, and pictures of history. The way you can use Guy Fieri as a verb and you kind of know what I'm talking about. The cartoon image, the photographic convention, effect, 
and optics play a part in how the painting functions to play with meanings, conveyance, and reading. Oil paintings carry a weight of history painting, portraiture, and landscape, while airbrush and acrylic speak to the industrial image, commercial and manufactured images. But all are embedded in the histories of violence and exist as cultural commodities. But in all image conventions remain intact as conventions, familiar, violent, and abound in politics. I see my work more like a punk song, loud and obnoxious. And if you can stay in the noise and stick around, hopefully it has some good lyrics if you're willing to read what's being screamed at you. So that gives us some framework for how I'm utilizing painting before we kind of look at what the paintings are a picture of. So this painting here is called Cro-Magnanimous, a combination of Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal and Magnanimous, uh, defined as generous or forgiving, especially toward a rival or less powerful person. All right, so th this painting shows a Neanderthal skull optically vibrating before a blurry image of a white nationalist march upon the University of Virginia. I'm not exactly trying to have the viewer understand this. I'm hoping there's a breadcrumbs that lead you there, like some things in the background torches start to emerge and it looks like a group of people. Uh, so if not, hopefully some sense of familiarity, familiarity even with the conventions of photographic imagery developing in the mind. The skull being a reference to the dead and caveman a reference for the meathead ideology, as well as a trope in art history as memento mori, that we all will die too. The trope or style of comic image references, as most of my work does stylistically, a 90s aesthetic basically an amalgamation of Hanna-Barbera, Warner Brothers, like Max, Max Fleischer and Tex Avery, as well as underground comics like R. Crumb and Basil Wolverton, so basically Ren and Stimpy. I also find inspiration in the album art of 80s and 90s thrash bands, Earth AD by The Misfits, Rado de Parals, Brazil, or Martha Splatterhead by The Accused, most specifically. This trope for me carries an anti-authoritarian language with it, while not taking itself too seriously. I think it's an important distinction because it's the difference between real hardcore and the meathead metal like Pantera, which espouses violence and toxically masculine ideations of toughness, chest beating and white supremacy. Or pothead goofballs like Green Jelly versus bands like Mayhem, who actually burn churches down. The aesthetic and work are serious but not self-aggrandizing. This entrenches the imaginative images into an aesthetic category as a form of critical image. For that, uh, I'm also interested in the line between entertainment and culture, and subsequently what that means to aggression versus violence. So here's some uh, references that uh, get an idea of what I'm talking about. So I, I also would like to mention that all of my work is hand drawn. I don't use any gridding or projectors because it's much more important that I redraw or learn to draw the thing that I'm focused on. So as you can see by the nature of the show, if you get to see it, I cycle through images and they kind of audition for me through drawing. I make a selection and they move on or repeat, not as motifs, but as characters acting their symbolism for me. And I can place them in these photographic spaces. So just some background and where the aesthetic dialogue comes from in the cartoon language. So <laughs> thinking of it as a kind of painting of the manufactured image. So. It's a, it's a direct painting of the manufactured image, not so much about manufacturing images. So here's uh, Bill Ray, right, famously from Ren and Stimpy. And here's some of those album covers I've mentioned. So you can start to see some of the influence there. This painting is called Yal Qaeda. Uh, this piece is an examination of religious extremism. In a large sense, I would say Confederate cosplay is a sort of worshiping for racists and other irredeemable people. And in reference to the mounting violence over the summer of 2020 by far right incels and radicalized inbreeders, comparing them to the violence uh, perpetrated by foreign terrorist entities. It was, a, a, it was impossible not to see the images of people in trucks waving Bibles and AKs comparably to the news imagery out of the Middle East or the similarities between Marjorie Taylor Greene and Osama bin Laden's choice of self-presentation. The foreground image is a mix between a ghost, a clan hood, and a drippy used condom. So it has a crazed screaming monster mouth and is holding a gun 
in a sort of uh, action comic style, a stand in for the specter of history, ever present screech in our collective conscious. This is a uh, sleep of reason. So the title is a reference to the drawing by Francisco de Goya, The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. It shows a gooey, gooey mutant style melting head as if corroded by means of toxic waste. Its eyes boggle and tongue flops out of its mouth, screaming in either pain or lunacy, pure mental collapse. Composited with a blurry image of a figure being waterboarded, thinking about the motif in pop culture of the melting villain, the wicked witch or Judge Doom from Rob Rabbit the toxic Avenger or tar man from Return of the Living Dead, alluding to the dehumanization of enemies in the relation to war or incarceration, thinking about being swept up in justice and losing our moral character in times of conflict. Uh, Goya also being an artist who painted Durid during his own plague, also painted the mentally ill, deformed and psychotic like plague hospital, as well as state sanctioned violence like the 3rd of May. Fetish. So this is an older work, uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, it was made alongside Cro-Magnanimous and Mall Cop, the, the next image we'll be looking at. Analyzing comics imagery's reflection of authority and entitlement. In this piece, I, des I designed a sort of anti-hero style detective trope character, like Decker from Blade Runner, or any cop that doesn't play by the rules, copaganda style hero, Beverly Hills Cop, or Die Hard, or probably too many uh, to mention as we go on. So I wanted to uh, project this with an image that pointed at the viewer. The blurry image in the background suggests two figures are aiming guns at the viewer, also as posed figures trying to convey their toughness or righteousness through their gun ownership. Fetish relates to the term of erotic displacement and sexual attraction. It is used in psychoanalysis as well as Marx's critique to distinguish distinguished between use value and inflated capital value. This piece was also made prior to the two idiots in St. Louis who were pointing their guns at the protesters, but like that contains a kind of aggressive relationship to the viewer. This is Mall Cop. So Mall Cop inserts a mutant nerd into the figuration of the blurred image, wherein the interaction is more impressed, not disruptive. This piece plays with the doofus authority trope and speaks to qualification. Mall cop is a derogatory term of a wannabe cop, usually people who would abuse authority if given the chance, as notably many serial killers try to become police officers before their crimes or during. The mutant nerd is a meditation on incel culture, gamers or people online who spout hate and hide behind a non-labels like Q conspirators. Although this was made before I heard much about Q, I, I think about the angry nerd who shoots up the school or the, uh, you know, dons a uniform to start to gain significance or agency in society. This piece is called <laughs> Who Wants Johnsonville Brats, Johnsonville Brats, Johnsonville Brats. And of course, anyone familiar with the, the old commercials that's supposed to kind of be a, a, a receding echo uh, in the title. but. This is a reference to a commercial from the 90s, maybe 2000s, I can't really remember, uh, where a dad grilling would yell this phrase and would echo throughout the landscape, calling attention to everyone at the campground. And then they would all show up for a brat. At least that's how I remember it. Uh, we see a shrieking monster beside itself overlaying the American flag seen through razor wire. It both doubles as an image of incarceration and border security. The language of interior and exterior as far as freedom goes. Are we kept out or are we locked in? I also like the reference of the echo of the commercialized Americana in the title. This piece is uh, 357 with cheese. This is my first attempt at airbrush actually. So I was trying to figure out how to move forward with more imaginative work for the longtime viewers in the audience know that Previously, I was appropriating images from cartoon history and pop culture, but at this point, I wanted to I wanted the work to function uh, within invention, innovation, and imagination. So, switching to character design, reactionary, impulsive drawing, and things like astral projection helped to move away from appropriation in my use of characters. So, this piece uses an image of a figure with a ski mask on an ambiguous notion of hero villain tropes as some SWAT members will usually utilize the ski mask in their operations. 
the cloud and title are a reference to Ronald McDonald and gun culture, either murdered or suicided in some violent fashion. This is a uh, Cool Ranch Davidians. So a play on Doritos and the participants in the siege in Waco in the 90s. Along with this, uh, the LA riots, the Gulf War, Rodney King, the OJ chase, the Challenger disaster, so many more. This was an early piece of media violence that sticks with me. So th uh, this is one of the, the last pieces to use appropriated imagery that I did. Uh, there are other instances in the show, of course, but there are there's some cowboy kids with guns with a doubled image of a member of the Ant Hill gang from Wacky Races. I don't know if anyone remembers that show, but so that's an image taken from an old advertisement for toy guns. The mobster is kind of a catch-all villain figure along with the cowboy kids as the heroes or fantasy murdering the bad guys kind of situation. Uh, they're shooting at the mobster while the Branch Davidians, kids and all, burns down in the background. So I, I also have a piece in the Progressive Collection that utilizes Dick Dastardly in Waco. So it's kind of an image seared into my mind. I think it has something to do with uh, you know, being so small, watching cartoons and then seeing the news that day. So this is uh, Death of Narcissus. Uh, Death of Narcissus is uh, some of the newest work in the show. In this piece, I'm really thinking about time. The cartoon image is re reminiscent of cartoon imagery. Specifically, I'm looking at Halloween cats from the 1920s. Uh, thinking about the trope of death in the halo as you rise to heaven. Uh, the image combined with the patriotic conventions of the image behind it. So we see uh, flag colors and a figure wearing a mask, uh, hopefully drawing attention to our idea of the 1920s and our 20s, the 2020s. So narcissists also killed themselves because they couldn't have what they wanted, which was essentially their own ideological sense of self, sort of a jab at MAGA culture as well as, you know, uh, Trump's narcissism post-election. So just for reference, here's some of those cats from the 1920s. You see their crying faces. This piece is called uh, Interdimensional Shape-Shifting Child Molesters. The title is borrowed from something Alex Jones had said. I'd always thought it was so imaginative. He should write science fiction and Q should write John Grisham novels. It coincides with the Comet Pizza controversy, where an armed man showed up to demand the release of children being held by the Clintons in the basement of a pizzeria. The interdimensional being has elongated pupils like a goat, a typical satanic symbol, and frequent iconography in the conspiracy circles involving baby eating and adrenochrome. Uh, it's as if someone watched Monsters, Inc. and took it as fact. The image is of the Comet Pizza neon sign behind the figure uh, where the gunmen and several conspiracy YouTubers ended up uh, showing up to escalate the situation, essentially. All right. So we can move on to my drawing practice. So uh, to give some framework, my drawings in particular span a similar scope to my paintings, uh, being a reflection or response to media and pop culture effects on American psyche, uh, drawing me through a, a more personal, uh, it functions more intimately, uh, less about historicity of images and function of art history, but a more immersive, raw and undiluted look into the mental interior. Not all of my drawings, but most of the drawings for this show function in this way, and for this purpose, I think, uh, starts to speak into a certain similar kind of chamber of meanings uh, as the paintings do. So why am I obsessed with this stuff? Uh, uh, why are we obsessed with this stuff as a culture? And it, as, we add into, and as we head into a kind of uh, nothingness, dead future, I think about uh, Bosch paintings, uh, his depictions of hell, the flaying of St. Bartholomew, the bombings of Hiroshima, Columbine, and 9-11, and we, we start to look like a culture that's manufactured by tragedy. This drawing was inspired by uh, robot tropes like Terminator and Robocop. I thought about 1984, when in Room 101, it, Winston is given a lecture about the future of humanity and is told to imagine a boot stomping on, human, on a human head forever. This would be the robot authority, maybe. So the drawings, uh, 
drawings don't have titles as of yet, or maybe they never will. I'm sure if the uh, I'm sure they'll become other things or just stay drawings for for the most part. This is a drawing of a severed hand I labeled the Garden of Eden down in the bottom corner. Uh, I drew this after reading Black Hole by Charles Burns and was inspired to emulate some of his graphic devices. Uh, after thinking about it, there are two other Cleveland artists that adhere to Charles Burns style of illustration. I think about Durf Back Dirt's art uh, in his response to, to Burns, as well as Jake Kelly, who does a lot of flyer work for the Grog Shop and other Cleveland venues. I think there's some uh, definite response, and I wonder where the Cleveland connection comes in to someone like Charles Burns, why are we so infatuated with him here in the Midwest? But I imagine finding a separate hand in the woods, uh, how it would be kind of matter of fact. There'd be no kind of music swell or dramatics, just you and the hand. Uh, the image that I continue to come back to both art historically and conceptually while selecting uh, work for the show was the crucifixion. I think it definitely caught my interest as a kind of fetishized moment of violence in our culture. So it really just serves me to think about the reality of the situation. This commie murdered by cops and the people who worship him are cop lovers that hate commies. But also the brutality of this image in general has always seemed a bit much. Uh, this is a short design for art history, the band I am with, in, with a couple local artists, Jake and Zach, who I think are present here today. Uh, where Jesus' arm is twisted into the text, Art History, the name of the band. Uh, I'm sure it means different things to all of us, but the reason I like the name of the band, Art History, at least the way I learned it and that it was been presented up until recently, is Art History is white history, as well as the history of wealth, power, and corruption. And to have a name begin to interrogate that concept seemed uh, a great concept for a hardcore band. So this isn't the final image for this design. This was the initial drawing. I repeated the term thought terminating cliche at the bottom while listening to some online lecture. Uh, I thought about how religion is often used as an excuse to stop our analysis of thought, <coughs> analysis of things to be like, well, that's how it goes. That's what God wanted. So, so that's the way it is. Uh, this is a hentai Jesus. Uh, this image came from the idea of the fetishization of Christ's death. It plays on the tropes of anime porn, as well as enculturation of the term daddy and God punishment, authority, pleasure, and degeneracy. So this also stems from the reaffirmation of the conservative right and far right ideologies, religious exigency. I think a lot about TV shows that would tout things like Jesus helping a little white kid find his dog, uh, you know, some bullshit like that. And I always think, uh, wow, we could have stopped the Holocaust, but we spent all our Jesus bucks on Timmy's dark shoot. So part of the show is dedicated to settings as spaces for violence or manifestations of inflicted violence or containing its characteristics, places where this sort of nuanced conversation is coming from. This suburban home uh, burning down in the style of 1960s home and garden magazine illustrations is pretty straightforward. Uh, thinking about modernity, the home, class, and family. I was also thinking about a lot about backgrounds of cartoons and comics and their function. This one was inspired, of course, by Bill Ray from Ren and Stimpy. They always had these still images in Ren and Stimpy that enhanced the grotesque. And his painting style is what enhanced those moments for me watching that show. Uh, these are some bombed out buildings that reflect on war and poverty simultaneously. They reflect on destruction by bomb or by economy. Anybody that's been driven through East Cleveland uh, will know what I'm talking about. Um, I thought about the hotel postcard from uh, some dismal place or how to begin and end a narrative simultaneously. I explore in later images the beginning and the end simultaneously. But during my research for constructing graphic novels, uh, graphic narratives, a uh, device used in storytelling is to have the opening image and closing image be kind of a mirror of each other. I thought, what if they were the same, the beginning and the end? It has no text and is kind of laid out like an advertisement uh, inviting us to nowhere. Oh, here's a little castle on a hill. For this, I was really thinking about the development of land ownership. 
how castle fetish and culture manifest as a desire for authority or land ownership, uh, usually a setting for a fantasy story about desires of power and fame without work or produ uh, producing anything. So aristocracy, landlord style, or male heroism where the reward is sex. At the bottom, it says the romance of authority. I'm thinking about how in reality uh, of wealth and how in our reality of wealth income uh, that we live in a kind of corporate aristocracy, a kind of fetish of power, desire of fascism, a kind of push for kings and hierarchy, which is a lot of what I saw in the Trump movement and this conservative political push to the right. So I'm, I'm thinking about settings, space and place, as well as landscape, exterior and panning shot, how these tropes build concepts into story. Uh, this procession of drawings reflects on the cyberpunk genre, wherein we see a wealth gap at its most dismal and fantastical. Although what is not, uh, what is most, what was most surprising when beginning to develop some of these works, uh, especially thinking about as a graphic narrative, was that dumber shit keeps happening in real life that negates the imaginative aspect of any prospect of an image of the future. So cyberpunk was a genre that criticized the future, criticized the possibility of corruption through a prescient storytelling as is sci-fi tradition, like 1984 or Brave New World. So I was inspired by Akira here, Akira, the, the graphic novel, uh, the movie also, but mostly the graphic novel. Um, uh, that there is a reference to the decimation of landscape from atomic annihilation embedded in the storytelling of Katsuhiro Otomo. Uh, deformation, uh, deformation from uh, nuclear mutations, powers developing from exposure uh, that is ingrained into the Japanese psyche. I also look at cyberpunk as a critique of untethered capitalism. What happens when we allow the constant progression of wealth and consumption? So this would be a setting for those sorts of spaces. A portion of the show is given to the ideation of character development uh, that becomes part of my larger practice. So my design method is to create archetypes, to embody concepts of interest, creating protagonists and antagonists, victims and perpetrators in the imaginations of the world that I'm playing with. So here we have the cat that became part of the Death of Narcissus painting, which grew out of a sketch you know, book drawing you know, from a meeting or something like that, probably. So some of these things happen during contemplative studio time, uh, but some happen on napkins, computer paper, or as I said, during meetings or wherever. Here's the progression of an inter interdimensional shape-shifting child molester. Uh, this is also useful as a way to imagine uh, them rendered versus in graphic space, uh, how they could be utilized in other formats mostly what parts can be exploited into optical functions, as you see in the painting work. Uh, here's a se uh, severed penis character. Uh, I'm not sure where these things are, are gonna kind of end up. I was thinking about a crown for this one, maybe, but this comes from a Freudian concept, I'm sure most of you are aware of. Uh, also contemplating ideas of masculinity, I'm hoping that my work speaks out of both sides of its mouth in a way where it can be seen as a neat, you know, a neat concept, oh, that's cute, uh, or analyze and study investigations of image history. So that line between entertainment and, and culture, uh, as well as how they affect us. So just, just uh, going through some of these, this is White Trash Brainiac here on the left, a mutant or deformed character, maybe some kind of demon and then a pinhead. So I think these will usually manifest into uh, other, other types of painting and then eventually end up in an oil painting or, or one of my airbrush acrylic paintings. Uh, this is a Frankenstein's monster. Uh, this one has a vagina added to it to use as a sex toy when he's done terrorizing the villagers. The Frankenstein becomes a kind of metaphor. So as Bruce Sterling says in his talk, A Temporality in the Creative Artist, he talks about a period where we uh, develop a kind of Frankenstein aesthetic that only responds to the picture of now, a kind of Frankensteining of the past, uh, like Jamie and Volani, Trey Abdella, Kenyon Castator, some artists that I could think of. 
kind of David Sally or James Rosenquist of the internet. So I feel some of my previous work was headed in this direction. I also think that you just end up responding to the algorithm you manifest as an internet pop artist, or it becomes incestually about your experience of the internet. Not so much popular culture, but authoritarian commercialism, which is interesting in some ways, uh, but it was a major factor in why uh, manufacturing my own pop culture uh, items, own, my own comics, my own cartoons uh, became important. Uh, character design started to help me into the more imaginative spaces. Here's a beheaded uh, mutant pig. I'll just let you all play with that in your own minds for a little bit. Uh, here's a design procession for Sleep of Reason. The redrawing and reiteration helped to translate it, its final piece in the paintings. It becomes uh, much like a cartoon character to remember how to draw it. Again, uh, thinking about the melting monster trope, Toxic Avenger thing. Here it is in context of the show and the title. So as in my work, I'm interested in a kind of strange looking, I think about my work taking, uh, talking over itself. Well, where should I be looking? What am I supposed to be focused on? This is a time cop. I was thinking about Slaughterhouse-Five, Kurt Vonnegut's analysis of what a fourth dimensional being might look like. So this is a time cop, probably from rookie to retirement or something like that. Uh, there's also a movie told, called Time Cop. I was thinking about making this one. So I think a lot about Bosch, uh, Hieronymus Bosch, uh, his depictions of agony and internal damnation, creatures of demented torture or tortured souls. So these guys are fused together, kind of deforming into a ball of flesh. I get a lot of inspiration from 80s and 90s horror cinema, things like From Beyond, uh, Reanimator, Tales from the Crypt, Terror Vision, Videodrome, and Dead Alive. These are all, they're all some, some great puppetry. And I think that has a, a great effect, you know, seeing that and uh, Hieronymus Bosch in a similar sensibility. So like them, here's a drawing of Eternal Damnation for Don Jr. and Giuliani. This is an uh, eternal spiky penis bandsaw that would essentially be connected infinitely and just run like that. Uh, this is a guy with 12 mustaches, maybe some sort of demon that talks too much or some form of uh, demented information troll. This, draw, uh, this guy's kind of having a bad day. So this is more kind of mutilated horror tropes inspired by illustrations of garbage, you know, garbage pale kids or pulp, Im pulp imagery like the original Norman Saunders paintings for the Mars Attacks cards. This drawing was inspired by Christian iconography. So another important thing to me is I, I think a lot about that medieval monster show from a few years ago at the CMA. I don't know if anyone got to go to that. So thinking about the manuscript its contents and the relationship to comic imagery was very profound. Uh, here we see uh, John the Baptist with a sausage in his mouth, kind of ax in his head, some other ambiguous nefarious stuff going on. Uh, I also really want to accentuate the presence of ink. So something you can't see here in uh, looking at a lot of comic imagery that's been you know, produced before being scanned and manufactured to to be a clean image for a comic, you get to see a lot of the, the ink production, the, the brush marks and the layering up of the material. So we don't get to see that much here, but it is present in the, in the work. Here we go. So this is a graphic narrative. Uh, it didn't make much sense to me at first, but there's no text except uh, where's the future? Where is the future we were promised, huh, punk? I called it Maggot Man number one, the death of Maggot Man. I imagined the narrative where we would just watch a body decay on the roof after a supervillain fight or something like that, and nobody ever finds the body or comes looking for him. So the essential narrative would beginning and end and begin at the same time uh, as I was talking about before, but I never continued that. Here's a close up of that. Uh, future lady seemingly watches this unfold from a different time. I think that's supposed to be me there, uh, failing to usher in the future. 
The narrative piece together from the developmental imagery shown here as a cluster in the show culminates in a final, pa uh, final pain where a disembodied voice yells to scramble the jets, the hippies are back. Uh, the hippie is devouring the city. So that I think this is a reference to uh, boomers destroying the economy, essentially. Housing market uh, is never retiring. And kind of like our president now is older than the one we had 30 years ago. It's kind of weird. Uh, he's not even a cyborg that we know of. So uh, this is a graphic narratives cluster. Uh, this is work in the back of the show that I'm thinking about as intentionally made for uh, conventional narratives. So they're supposed to be illustrative concepts that play with tropes of conventional narrative. This is a splash page for a young wolf a reference to Jungian archetypes. So I haven't made any strips for this one yet, but the basic premise is that Young Wolf would inevitably eat his classmates no matter what uh, action or driving narrative was happening. So, uh, you know, they could be having a good day on a field trip. The last panel is him eating everybody, but because uh, it's in his nature. So looking for a good catchphrase for him, like, did I do that or something like that? That's nature. I don't know. So the show is bracketed by these two drawings that play with the narratives in the show in a mostly illustrative way. The left is called turning into goofy as you die. And the right is uh, a, <laughs> the, uh, oh, sorry. The right one is called uh, Mima devouring her handsome boy. The image on the right is based on Saturn devouring his son. It has a doily halo and taped to the bottom of a composition is a phrase, the future had been canceled. I was thinking about baby boomers again. They're gonna all, they're probably gonna live, outlive the millennial. Uh, they probably will. I, I think about older generations always fearing the power of youth and destroying it like they're destroying the planet now or voting to prop up neoliberalism. Uh, hopefully that cycle will end soon, but let's see. The goofy drawing came about in a very interpersonal way. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but I thought, uh, would put a nice exclamation point on the show. So I thought about the last flicker of information in your mind as you die, the event horizon of existence from being into, from being into nothingness. And if at that moment, just right before the lights went out, the people around you started transforming into Goofy from the Disney cartoons, and you would enter oblivion, never knowing why or how they did it or what it meant. So anyway, well, thanks for listening. Uh, I can finish by walking us through an exhibition uh, in a way. This is the drawing I did for the layout here. So I have some install shots we can kind of quickly go through as a kind of traditional reading, right? We have, uh, here's the start of the show, reading traditionally from left to right. We get be begin with the Jesus narrative and interplay from the sleep of reason, as well as the show title vinyl we see there. So there's all those images up close. And we see the visual artist statement here on the right, which uh, I didn't show any images for in this talk, but as you look at them, there's kind of, uh, most of the things I'm talking about are written there, jotted down, or there's uh, fragments of ideas existing there. So we get some uh, image pillars here with mall cop and fetish up there up high. Some character designs and then the death of narcissus. Uh, none of the images there except for the little cat are, were in the talk, but there's several images there. Uh, I'm thinking about as clusters of notes, drawings, so fragments, that sort of thing. Then we see Yal Qaeda in the back next to the cluster of character designs. Coming back around, there's uh, Cool Ranch Davidians there in the corner, the narrative pieces into Cro Magnanimous. And then next to that, smaller into the graphic narratives, we have uh, Johnsonville Brats into 357, which he's into interdimensional shape-shifting child molesters. And you could see that kind of development of drawing there on the left uh, as, it, as it grew into the painting. And we end with the settings and then into Goofy and Death there on the right 
So that's the end of the show as you walk around from left to right. But um, thank you all for listening. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or type them in the chat and uh, Kaylee will read them to me. So if you want me to return to any image or discuss anything further, uh, I would be happy to. But thank you all for coming. There's also a YouTube playlist that accompanies the exhibition. I could post that in the chat. Uh, it's mostly songs about Jesus, but um, I could send it out if anyone's interesting or interested. But thank you all. Uh, hopefully have some time for questions. And hopefully that wasn't too, I needed the notes to, to get my brain organized. But uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm just should I just keep should I just keep this up and uh, yeah I don't know if you want to flick through them just to get people's um brains back I'll do it really fast the beginning. Like, yeah um, or if you want to pause on one that you particularly like but thank you much and um shout out to Lane Cooper for um choosing me for this show it's we'll stop here. we're happy that you're here um again if anyone I believe you all have permission to unmute yourselves um, you can also, un you can reveal your face to say hello, if you'd like. <laughs> Thanks. I have a question. Yes. Thanks, Mike. That was amazing. I appreciate it. I thought that was incredible. Um, I have kind of a rambling question that I've been thinking about in, in reaction to being in person with the show, and I really appreciate that um, the amount of work there and the way in which you've displayed it as such, because I know that there are conventions that put a limit on uh, how professional or unprofessional you're allowed to be in a gallery space. And I think that just sort of tacking up the, the pages from the notebook or the sketchbook are really was a, a smart way to, to hang that. And when I think about your show, especially you were talking about all those different sections, um, kind of feel like you're, um, you talked about the lens of subjects that you're interested in, you know, primarily being those of, uh, surrounding violence and American masculinity and, and like kind of jingoism. And, um, and yet that we do those things really well. So that becomes like a whole treasure trove of things to, to dive into. And um, I've been listening to Roland Barth's mythologies a little bit recently. And, and that kind of reminds me of your practice I feel like, um, you know, that there are so many thinkers like that, 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 that we mine in, in school for their take on art, but we tend to forget that they focus on so many other things in culture. And I feel kind of like you're a bit, you're doing that a bit. So I was hoping that, you know, um, you could take us, just talk to us a little bit about um, that particular lens that you look at these things through and particularly when it comes to style, because you have a lot of different stylistic maneuvers going on in these drawings. So um, yes, does that make sense? Does that seem yeah, like it does. I, I love Roland Barthes and, and in mythologies, I you know that, that first essay in mythologies about wrestling really had a, a profound impact on me when I read that. I don't know if you've read that one yet, Tony. Yeah, but totally. Well, I was thinking about that and how strange it is to like go through something like the, et the etiquette of the facade of wrestling and then to focus on a type of car. Like there's so many disparate focus points and yet kind of like through that lens, you can start to see how they are exposing some sort of bigger zeitgeist that's happening in the culture that presented them. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, as a, as a young artist, you, you tend to think like, I'm learning how to enter this mysterious world and become smart there. But what you, you end up learning is that you've already been smart. If you have a sensibility to make art, I think you already have a sensitivity to, to, uh, to constructing intelligence, whether you're, you know, uh, for the students listening, I, hopefully you haven't fallen asleep yet, but, you know, thinking about, uh, and, and I know I've said this to, to a lot of people before, but it's like, whether you're watching Citizen Kane or a McDonald's commercial, you should be learning. You should be, uh, you know, uh, drawing material from that. You should be understanding what's happening to you, how it's affecting you and things like that. And to go beyond that, you know, I, I, I think even before uh, art, uh, I'm thinking about Walter Benjamin. He did a lot of writing about Mickey Mouse, uh, even the age of mechanical reproduction, I'm sure that's for most people very present in my work specifically. Um, 
but yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I, I, I let me talk about stylistically. Yeah, uh, as I said, the analysis of these things that that I've been kind of barraged with, and 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 I'm, I I think I'm pretty honest to say that none of none of the even when I am creating characters, I'm not appropriating images anymore. But I I still think that they're not fully of me. Everything is a part of a language that I'm borrowing from, and it's not. Uh, there's no such thing as purity, essentially. Is I guess what I'm getting at. But yeah, sorry, that's a ramble, but hopefully it makes sense. Did I answer the question, Tony? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Awesome. But uh, yeah, uh, I guess if, if we're still waiting for questions, I could just keep rambling. But um, yeah, that, that extends into, uh, I'm sure many people here are, are familiar with Slavoj Zizek, the kind of contemporary version of, of Bart and of Lacan. And he's looking uh, very closely at the impulse, the you know, the impulse of analyzing, you know, television and movies, and and think about, you know, Lacanian psychoanalysis and and how we start to build a picture of capitalism in our minds, right? Uh, for anybody that's read Mark Fisher's book Capitalist Realism, we start to get a uh, he uses Zizek a lot to talk about how you know, most uh, kind of like the Anthropocene where humans have touched all of the earth, right? The earth is just curated. There's no such thing as nature anymore. But that capitalist realism uh, projects that all of our being is touched by capitalism. And, you know, our dreams, our desires, our fears, all of it are manifested in that. So, yeah, sorry for rambling. Are there other questions? Flip around and some other stuff. Who's your favorite artist right now? Lane Cooper. No, I'm just. Um, I don't know. Um, I've actually been, you know, I've I've kind of been looking at a lot of graphic uh, graphic narratives. So I'm thinking a lot about. Hmm. That's a that's a hard one. I think I think there's just a lot of them. I, I think that's an unfair question because ten minutes from now it'll change, right? I could look at I could look at Instagram and that could change. I could I could uh, find some garbage well, outside. I kind of know it's not fair, so that was one of the reasons for asking <laughs> just just to see what you would come up with. But I, I, there's a lot of people rattling around in there, but in thinking about uh, again, Katsuhiro Otomo, the the creator of Akira, but also like Hieronymus Bosch, I'm still looking at you know Luck Toymans, and I do like I do like the Frankenstein artists. I do like uh, some of Alani's stuff, not all of it, you know, uh, and that sort of thing. But I wouldn't necessarily say you know it's it's like that's interesting whatever that means you know their work is interesting i don't i wouldn't spend a hundred thousand dollars on it though uh i don't know if that's too aggressive or or whatnot but uh, not at all aggressive just uh just thinking about you know i know the artists that get me excited and i guess that's really where the question's coming from yeah i think it's just trying to uh i don't it's a weird time. It's a weird time, and I, I think it's a good thing to to have ADHD like me because I I like I like to read a page of a book and then watch half of a movie and then listen to music and then go on the internet and and all of that fulfills me. It's not like oh I didn't finish that book. It's like who cares? You know what I mean? I I got what I got off of that page and and I'll I'll buy another book sometime. Um, but it, it it's mostly about uh, you know rummaging through as much culture as possible and in trying to to figure out um, you know I'm really invested now in in creating a comic and really 
pushing into that. Uh, I'm kind of back and forth into creating cartoons. Uh, I, I have a tablet for digital animation and I come up with an idea and then it, you know, it doesn't fulfill some kind of artistic endeavor for me. So I usually stop and then I'll, you know, I'll just say I'll come back to that soon. But I think the graphic novel thing is is really starting to take a forefront while I continue my painting practice. I don't even know how I got to this topic, but I'm here. <laughs> Are there um, other? Do, we got a few questions in the chat that I can read out. Yeah. Um, Arnie's asked, could you talk a bit more about graphic novels and animation and how they influence you? It seems folks tend to think about those kinds of art making as quote low, but for me, they can be the most real and culturally influential. Yeah, and you know, to that point, um, you know, as we speak, they just had like a Daniel Klaus exhibition in New York. There's a Katsuhiro Otomo, uh, his his original um, Akira drawings are in a in a gallery in Chelsea right now. They're it it's and I do I do I I do still share the sentiment, Arnie, that you know people look at a kind of low and high, but I I think the way I'm thinking about it is less about low and high, but uh, through intent. Like a lot of the art in my show isn't made for reproduction. I'm not drawing some of those comic images to become comics. I'm drawing them for them to become drawings. So I'm thinking about intent or commercial versus cultural, this line between entertainment and, and that sort of thing. So I think, I think the reason that I, I try to create my own comics in cartoons, as I was saying earlier, uh, is because I want, you know, I again, I I feel like it would just come out like I was appropriating them anyway. I'm trying to find tropes in myself uh, and put them out in the world so that people understand them as as my as tropes in themselves. Maybe not, you know, the mutant nerd, but uh, that's a little more ambiguous. But I think like this one, the the kind of anti-hero cop, you know, could be could be a convention that we all generally understand. And as I said in the talk, uh, you know, thinking about like, if I say, if I, if, if I use Guy Fieri as a kind of uh, a verb, like, oh, he's going to come over here and Guy Fieri all over the place. You kind of know what I'm talking about. And it, it's a, it's, a, it's a way in which a, a language starts to not deconstruct, and I don't think it's a bad thing, but it starts to reshift into, uh, you know, new forms of communication. So what I'm hoping is that um, in the future that there's a kind of democratization of it all anyway, right? That hopefully we're heading not into an inflated cyberpunk reality, but that at some point that that crescent comes back down and, and we start to uh, start to democratize things or start taking democracy seriously so that, you know, if you're making a comic book or a painting, it doesn't matter that it's all you know, as long as you're thinking clearly about what you're doing and not uh, purposefully putting hateful things out into the world that it should be allowed. I, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question already, but thank you. Arnie says, thank you. This has been so enlightening. Love this work. Thank you. Um, I have a thought that I haven't really formed into a question, but there are two questions in the chat that I will probably loop in. Um, so I'm thinking about iterative practice and um, is it more, it, it seems to lean one way or the other, depending on what you're working with, but um, iteration and reiteration as a means to like shake out something that you can run with. Uh, you said something about like, I want to, iterate something to like exploit the flaws in it or mm -hmm. uh, ex how you can exploit it in an optical fashion or optical matter. Um, but also um, like iteration as a means to mimic how you process or as a means to like contemplate further. Um, so thinking about iteration and where to stop iteration, where to pause, um, Jordi asks, Mike, how do you choose which of your drawings uh, to extend into paintings? 
Hmm. It, some, sometimes it happens on accident, sometimes on purpose. I think um, sometimes I force them onto stage and, and then it feels a little like uh, exploitative. I, you know, if I, if I could be honest, I, I might say that like inter, interdimensional shape-shifting child molesters seemed a little like, there we go. You know what I mean? It was, it was, a, it was a way where, where things, uh, I kind of forced them into place, like I forced the square peg through the round hole instead of it kind of finding itself, uh, if that makes sense, Jordy. But, um, and, and again, I think, you know, working through iteration is, is how they kind of dance in my mind. It's, it's how I, it, again, it, in, the, in the talk, I, I talked about it as them kind of uh, auditioning for me. Like when I draw them, who are you? Like, what are you doing? Oh, you're a white supremacist monster. I'm going to put you into a picture about a Trump rally. You know what I mean? Then they, as they, as they kind of audition through me through, through iteration, then they find their place or they, you know, or they become, like I said, like, uh, like the young wolf, uh, I could kind of scroll through, but, you know, I, I come up with these innocuous ideas and I, I try to play with them in my mind where they might exist. And then they might just end up being a, a kind of poster or, a, or or this sort of drawing and then never see a, another another iteration. Or who knows, I might come back to this in three years and go, all right, it's time to do it. But uh, you know, just surrounded by piles of drawings all the time. Just, yeah, that's the other thing maybe to mention is that the show is actually edited. Like there's, <laughs> there is a lot more I could have put in, but I didn't. Yeah, I think interrogate interrogate is a good word for that. So you're almost like buying them time to speak, to whisper to you what they are. Yeah. Uh, and I guess um, Maeve also has a question here um, related, but maybe not so much to character development. Um, but Maeve asks, when you create settings, are they specifically for the characters or do they exist separately? I think they exist separately because, um, you know, I. I, I have, and there, there's some cowboys in the show, but you know, I, I think about like what a saloon means, right? Like what, uh, thinking about the cyberpunk landscape or something like that, or the castle being a setting. But I, I don't see them as iterations of any of my other characters because they, they exist in that kind of, uh, whatever that space is, right? That space of like the Earth AD cover or something like that, or that, uh, you know, they exist here in, uh, you know, something like that, like this, where, wherever this is, some kind of hell or, or something like that. That's where most of my characters are. And then, yeah, like, like as I was saying to Kaylee, I, I might pluck one out of there and let them dance around in my head for a couple of weeks and then be like, no, you know, you're, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not, well, I, I don't know where you belong. So they go back to the pile, but the settings are specific to me uh, thinking about landscape and thinking about setting in a particular way, and then almost making the setting a kind of character instead of having it be a, having it be a place for those characters to exist. Other characters would exist there. So the, I guess the characters would come from that space if I were to investigate who was in that space, I, if that makes sense. But I. I don't necessarily go, this is where this, you know, guy with his head caved in could live, but uh, yeah, so hopefully that, that's. Um, I like where you were landing there of like the character makes the setting because I'm thinking about specifically the, the goofy piece um, and Mama near the end of the show where the characters like decaying flesh is the setting love it yes so they are both setting and that's yeah. a interesting way to look at it yeah um I but mean, yeah they might yeah. exist in art history or they might exist at a trump rally or as i said when they're auditioning but the settings are much more uh, uh, about the place like uh and stereotypically everyone says you know uh new york city is like a character in spider-man right or like uh that sort of thing like the character 
is part of the setting. So thinking about the setting as a character or of, of its characteristics, if that makes sense. Looks like we have one more question in the chat. Um, and then if you'd like to drop your YouTube link, your, your yes. soundtrack slash playlist, that'd be great too. I could um, do all day. <laughs> C, C has asked, how does the concept of purity relate meathead to all the other hardcore that you've mentioned, thinking about poser versus purity? Mm -hmm. But I think I think there could be, I think you could be a poser and be sincere. Uh, and I, I also think you could be sincere and be a meathead, right? Like, or be insincere, like attempting to be a meathead. I guess, you know, um, Something I didn't talk about in the in the script of of how I'm thinking about things, and maybe this is a good time to to bring it up is is my role in uh, whiteness, right? In my work, and I guess something I think about a lot is, you know, a lot of the bands that I I grew up listening to. There's a lot of bands I don't listen to anymore because they use uh, you know misogynistic uh queer bashing language and stuff like that so it, it's a fine line from back in the day but now you know um sorry I, i'm kind of losing my track but I, I guess what i'm saying is is there is a fine line between all that and i think that that question exists in that space between uh aggression and violence but also between culture and entertainment Right, like if somebody's really making art or just mimicking art to uh, to portray evil or to propose evil into the world, 